think everybody's almost settled in by this time. <laughs> so welcome to everybody. Good morning. Um, we've had our obligatory Sunday rain shower. Uh, I feel like every Sunday, except for maybe one or two, we've gotten a little bit of rain. Um, and so I hope that you all are dry and well, and thank you for coming. I want um, to do a couple of things just by in terms of welcome. So Bill and Emily, can you introduce us to your guests this morning? You might need to take your uh, bill, might want to stand and talk, use your outside voice. Connor, you notice how now you're mentioned quickly and briefly, and she's mentioned a lot. So guys, welcome. It's so nice to see you. We're glad you're here. And I am so glad that Miss Lois Hoffman is here. Miss Lois, welcome to you. It's been a little while since you've been with us, and I'm glad that you're back here with us. So welcome, friend. And also, there are a couple of other persons who are uh, celebrating today. I've already heard one gentleman tell me he has his birthday. Um, he lied about his age. So if you are having a birthday today, please stand. Uh, yeah, that, that works too. I think, you should, I think you should claim it when you can. So whose birthday is tomorrow? Emily's is tomorrow, yours is today. Mine was yesterday. Yesterday. But he lied about his age. So he told me he was 23. I mean, 16, 16. So, but welcome, happy birthday, Dick. Oh, wait a second, David, happy birthday. This is the third time this month you've stood. <laughs> so, David, what number are we? 76. 76. Wow. So we're going to sing happy birthday to you all. Here we go. Happy birthday to. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. So happy birthday, everybody, happy birthday. Is there anyone celebrating an anniversary? Anyone? No one is? Okay. I also want to extend a word of welcome. We have a... Oh, I'm sorry. Ted and Mike are celebrating their anniversary. <laughs> so, Ted, it's you and Arlene. So, what number is it? 28. 28. Let's say happy anniversary to, to Ted and Arlene. Okay? Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Congratulations, guys. I also want to extend a, a word of greeting to the dear lady sitting in the back row. Good morning to you and welcome. I'm glad that you're here. We, we continue to pray for you, friend. And it's so good to see you. And I also want to say to all of you, um, I, and I was informed that today is actually the last day, but the, the, the moving wall, the Vietnam wall, I'm not sure what the right term is. If you've not had the chance to see that, um, it's very much worth seeing, very important to see. Um, my first memory of national events as a as a young person, it was really Watergate. I'm of that age, and that was what I remember being on television. And I remember being old enough to realize what was understanding, but young enough to say that all the hearings and things were getting in the way of my TV watching. Um, but I remember also Walter Cronkite, who, Jenna, you have no idea who that is, I know coming on TV and talking about the count of soldiers that were killed or are injured and things. So 
I, I think it's important that we celebrate these national and community things. And I'm just going to ask if you, just ask you if you are a Vietnam War veteran to please stand. I think it's all gentlemen at this point. Um, gentlemen, I know that perhaps for some, uh, the welcome home was not all that it could have been. Uh, on behalf of myself and this church, we just want to thank you for your service, for a job well done, and we wish you God's very, very best this day and from every day forward. So thank you. Um, one other announcement, and an, an announcement about announcements. Um, Dave Moquin's service is 2 o'clock this coming Saturday at the Grand Hotel. And please know that you are invited to come and participate and to be present with us. Okay. With regard to the announcements, I am aware that sometimes our announcements go a little long. I want to tell you why. For the longest time, we could not give you a bulletin we had very limited ways of contacting people. Yes, we have constant contact. We have all the technological, electronic means. Um, however, um, not everybody accesses those, right? And not, uh, not everybody in this generation, this room, excuse me. And I think even for your benefit, for my benefit, there were the statements about what the church is doing during this time of COVID pandemic. Um, now we can give you a bulletin. And if you look in the back is a list of announcements. And um, I'm going to ask you to please, <laughs> not during the sermon, but sometime to read that list of announcements and to be aware of it. And that way we don't have to continue sharing them verbally from the pulpit and other things. And we're going to have some special announcements um, in May with the, the mission trip and some other things. But we're going to try to reduce that uh, amount. I think it's important that during all that was happening, I feel, felt it was important during all that was happening that you know your church is continuing on. And not just in a little bit, but we're trying, tried very hard to go strong. And the staff was incredibly helpful to that. You all as, as visitors and, and as members were very helpful in that. Thank you for that. Your financial support was incredible, um, continues to be that way. We're going to just omit the announcement portion except for special things. And I am going to invite you please to read. What I don't want to happen is someone to say to me, gee, Reverend Brown, I didn't know that was going on. So you guys are adults. You can be aware of this. And I'm just going to ask you to, to know what's happening in the life of your church and to jump in and help. Because I can tell you there's a lot of neat stuff coming up. VBS, mission trip, Sunday school starting, uh, United Methodist men on Saturday at Denny's in Ocean City, just all kinds of fun stuff, all practiced with concern for the health and well-being of everyone. So please do be aware of that. Now, I think it's also important that we turn to Dick for our prelude.
Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jenna Bradford. Welcome to Community Church at Ocean Pines. I am so excited that you have chosen to worship here this morning. Thank you for your physical or virtual attendance this morning. Please pray with me. With all our hearts, we take refuge in God Most High, who created all things, the merciful Father, source of all goodness. With all our hearts, we take refuge in Christ, the Redeemer of sin, who restores our true nature, the perfect and mysterious word. With all our heart, we take refuge in the one who embraces the universe, who at all times and in all places respond to our need, the pure and tranquil Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Leave your mask on and participate in our responsive reading. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. May our heart is glad in God, and us we trust in God's holy name. Let us make a joyful noise to the God with songs of praise. We praise you, O God, we acknowledge you to be the Lord. Please be seated as we hear and are uplifted by Hymn 145, Morning Has Broken. that you have had a wonderful, wonderful week since we last gathered. This past week we had the occasion on Wednesday to celebrate Administrative Professionals Day and of course we recognized Maud and Maud was here in our first service. I was just looking around. I don't see her now but if you get the chance, thank Maud. Uh, somehow we were able to extend the day into the whole week and we showered her with gifts and opportunities for lunch which she made us go on and we give thanks for that. Yesterday I had a dear friend, uh, Roxanne Berry, who was there at the Parsage to help me clean up and spruce up and to do all kinds of things. It was a very productive day. And if I have another, it might kill me. So I hope your week has been productive and great in every way. Do you have joys that you would like to share today? Anybody at all? Um, you're pointing at, the, at Bill or the baby? Okay, so getting to see your grandchild is a joy. Absolutely, Emily, absolutely. And I'm sorry. I'm missing something because there's hands. Where? Okay, Miss Judy. I'm sorry, Miss Judy. Okay. 
good. Good for you. Good for you. If you all don't know Miss Judy, she's a neat lady. So you get take please take the chance to get to know her. The Zoom Bible study. She was right there with us, Zooming with everybody. Okay, now, a bunch of people were pointing. I, I think you were pointing at Judy. Are there any other joys that you'd like to share? Anybody at all? Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. I got my second vaccine. You got your second vaccine. Great, thank you. That's awesome. You know, and that's worth applauding. Um, you know, I've said to you before, as United Methodist, we believe that being concerned for ourselves is important, but being concerned for the other is even more important. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other joys? Anybody at all? all right, any concerns that you might have? I, I do want to lift to the, you the, fa uh, the fact that Jack Snyder uh, has injured himself. He fell. So please pray for Jack. Mary Stover is doing well. Um, Nancy Pierce's husband is having surgery tomorrow. There are you know, several things that are going on. One of the great frustrations is not being able to get into those facilities. Um, so please pray for those persons. But requests that you might have. Anybody at all? All right, let us pray together. Eternal God, on this Sunday morning, we gather for worship. You alone are worthy of our worship. You alone deserve and merit our worship. We come because we know and experience and feel your love. We come because you are with us and we're never alone whether we're celebrating or crying. We come because you are the God of the universe, a great and awesome and huge God, and yet tender enough to know our name. So this morning we come for the purpose of worship. All the other stuff, seeing one another and talking and visiting and hearing this beautiful music that Dick plays, all of this is extra because of the very core of what we're about is the living God. So we come today and we pray. We pray with confidence and with assurance and with joy because, God, we know that you're already working for our best and that you are answering our prayers in the ways that they need to be answered, even though sometimes we don't understand. And we pray, gracious and kind God, that as we pray together today, either verbally or silently, you who hear all will love us, strengthen us, help us, lead us in the days that lie ahead. We pray for our nation and its leaders. We pray for our world and its peoples. We pray for ourselves, not selfishly, but selflessly, so that we can be concerned about others, whether it come to vaccines or food or any other concern that they might have. And above all, we thank you for Jesus, who loves us and who died for us and who rose again. This we pray in the name of our Christ, and I invite you into a time of silent prayer. Please pray with me at this time the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, um, we're going to share in the scripture reading. Now, I want to, before Sharon comes, let you know there's been a slight editorial change by me. We're going to share in Psalm 23, but we're going to omit the John reading for another time. So, and I'm going to encourage you that as Sharon reads, that you look for differences in the scripture that she's reading, which is from the Common English Bible, and differences from what you and I memorized from the King James or the Revised or New Revised Standard. There should be three or four that you should pick up on, perhaps. Please take a look. Did you want me to play first? I do, Dick. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Dick, would you mind playing first? Okay.
Good morning. My name is Sharon Bradford. Psalm 23 reminds us that God is our shepherd, and therefore we lack nothing. God leads and guides us beside still water, provides food and protection, invites us to sit with our enemies before, until they become friends, and provides our internal home. Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd because he knows the sheep by name, and the sheep know his voice. Hear these comforting words regarding God, Jesus, as a good shepherd. The text for today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please remain seated as we hear and reflect on hymn 381, Savior Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. Dick, thank you for reminding me of your special music. After our conversation with Bob about Haydn and Bach, and I should have remembered, but it was excellent. Thank you so much. 
Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I am, have come to discover something about myself. And that is that on Sunday mornings, whenever a scripture is read and a story or a narrative or, or some place in the Bible is read, I often will comment, gee, that's my favorite. And many of them, most of them are. And they're favorites for different kinds of reasons. But I guess my true favorites in the New Testament is the Gospel of John. Um, I am not a Pauline scholar, don't claim to be one, probably will never be one, but I do love the Gospels, particularly John. And I also love the Old Testament book of Genesis and of Job for different reasons, even though I struggle with Job's ending. But my very favorite, you'll hear that again, is the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalm 103, Psalm 121, Psalm 46, Psalm 1, and today, Psalm 23. I would imagine that most of you, at some point in your life, memorized Psalm 23. How How many of you memorized it? How many of you memorized it in King James English? Okay. I will tell you that I had a reader from the first service came to me very concerned. He said, Dale, I made a mistake on the reading. And I said, well, it sounded great to me. And he said, no, no. He says, I substituted some of the King James words in there. And he says, is that okay? And I said, yeah, I think we're going to be okay. Because that's what's familiar to us. That's what's common for us as we learn the psalm. Why are the psalms important? The psalms are important for many reasons, but let's just consider a few. They're important because they give evidence to us of the history of the people of Israel. Now, narrative writing does this in a different way, but the psalms do through the details and and what is included and what's not included in a variety of ways They illustrate for us the history of God's people and of God's working with God's people throughout the life of many, many persons in the Old Testament. They are important because they are the prayer book, the hymn book of ancient Israelite worship. And I might add they remain frequently used in worship today. If you have an Episcopalian or a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox background, the Psalter takes a preeminent spot every Sunday morning. And even in Methodism, it plays a great role when you think of calls to worship and scripture readings and an ever-increasing, growing role in preaching. They're important because they allow for the whole bound of human emotion. When we think of God and we think of times of worship, we often consider times of great joy and celebration, right? Like when the king is enthroned or something happens and the psalms speak to all of that. But there are other psalms called imprecatory psalms where they're psalms of real anger and real hurt feeling. They're written at a time when the Israelite people are being taken out into exile and they want God to do their enemies harm. They also are important because they speak to our lives today. Many of you and I also will remember September 11th, back when George Bush was our president And with a lot of class and a lot of character and integrity, he endeavored to lead this nation in a very difficult time. We might remember that after the event, he was there and he was concerned about the children who would watch the planes crashing into the Twin Towers, into the Pentagon, into the 
field in Pennsylvania over and over again and the impact it might have on them. And do you remember what he prayed? He prayed, God, bless and comfort our children as they journey through the valley of the shadow of death. These words are familiar to us because we, most of us, were there on September 11th and remember where we were, but also because this psalm speaks to that reality. It's a psalm that is often used at funerals, right? And often what I will do when I perform a funeral service is that I will ask everyone there to recite the psalm with me, and it really doesn't matter if you get it perfect. It's where your heart and your soul is. And finally, it's a psalm that speaks to us about who God is is. Think with me just for a moment. Let your mind wander. Green grass, still water, a beautiful pastoral setting. It feels, sounds really good, doesn't it? It sounds calming even as we think of it. That's what the psalmist says God provides. God means God's being our shepherd means that we lack nothing. We have everything we need in God. And so what I'd like to do this morning with this psalm is to invite you into two questions, two places, two things about this psalm that seem a little odd or out of place or askew to me. Now, I don't mean they shouldn't be there, no. I just mean that over the years, as I've looked at this psalm, they've brought to me thoughts, questions, the need for further study. Here's number one. God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Now, after church on most Sundays, Gail and Jim and I go out to dinner. Many of you do, too. And I don't know about you, but I don't try to find a place where people are going to be mean to me, or people are going to dislike me. I don't try to find those places where I'm going to be made to feel uncomfortable simply because of who I am. And furthermore, I'm not even sure that I have an enemy. Have you ever thought about that? Do you really, do I really have someone who is out there seeking to do personal harm to you and me? I mean, there are people that perhaps I like better than others, or they like others better than me, or... You know, you know what I mean, and certainly not anybody in this room, but when we think about this, we really, do we really have an enemy? I guess maybe the enemies of my country could be my enemies, or maybe someone who thinks differently, or looks differently, or acts differently, maybe they could be my enemy, but the truth is, in terms of people who look or act or feel differently, what I find more often than not is that they want the same things out of life that I do. I, I don't get this whole concept of enemies. In fact, I'll tell you quite truthfully that perhaps the greatest enemy I have is named Dale. And maybe that's true for our, all of us. Maybe we are our greatest enemies when we say to ourselves, you can't do this, you can't accomplish that, you're not smart enough for that, you're not able when God says with me all things are possible. Maybe we say in self-talk and in self-doubt that we're just never going to live up. Maybe that's what an enemy is. But when I think about this particular line from the psalm, I've read one theologian who says it's a taunt. 
It's a taunt from the writer of the song to the enemy saying, look, I'm here and you thought you had done me in. I don't like that, to be quite honest. I think it's wrong, and so we'll just kind of toss that one out the window. What I think is that when we sit down with our enemies and we truly listen and we deeply care, we have the chance to turn our enemies into friends. That's the kind of world I want to live in. The kind of world where I can sit down with someone, maybe we've had a disagreement and a different idea about something, maybe their cultural experience is different, maybe they come from a whole different place in this world, but when I sit down and truly listen and they listen to me, we are heard and we hear, we don't have to take up acts of violence against one another. Maybe what this psalm is saying is that this same God who loves me loves everyone and invites them into relationship not only with God's self but also with me. Maybe what this psalm is saying is the same thing that Dr. King said when he said that love is the only force capable of turning an enemy into a friend. We in United Methodism have been working really, really hard at creating enemies, haven't we? That person's on the other side or in the other group or in the other camp, and certainly we can't get along with them, but well, yes, we can. They don't think the same way about this topic or that topic or this issue or that concern. It doesn't mean the concerns or the issues aren't important. What it means is that we better do what God tells us to do, and that is to love one another. When we sit at the table, that's an indication that... We're going to listen to, respect, fellowship with, care about the other person. And maybe in some ways we even identify with the other person. That got Jesus in trouble, didn't it? Sitting at the table with tax collectors and sinners and people who were not on the inside. But God loved them all the same. My son tells me that all of my movies that I like are old movies. It's okay, I don't mind. And a lot of them are black and white. I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird is my favorite movie, and there are some movies that are old, and then there are some movies that are simply middle-aged. They're not black and white, they're not current, they're just somewhere in the middle. One of those movies is an old Sally Field, Danny Glover, John Lithgow movie, go movie, Places in the Heart. You ever see Places in the Heart? Anybody ever see it? Well, this will mean something to four of you. It's a movie set in the Depression era. Sally Field's husband is the town sheriff, marshal, you know, whatever law enforcement reality there is. And he's called out to the train tracks where there's a young African-American boy who for the first time in his life has discovered alcohol. And he has a gun and he's shooting in the air. And this young man is a friend of his son. They're the same age. And the man goes out to disarm this young African-American boy and in the process is shot mortally and they bring him home to die and he dies it's a sad movie they go through crop failures and cotton problems and all kinds of stuff the clan is involved every kind of problem that can be faced is faced and at the end of the movie It is one of the most powerful endings that I have ever seen. I don't know who the director was, but or or how movies are made even really, but they deserve a huge amount of credit. Because at the end of the movie, they're all sitting together in church. And those who have survived and are living are present. 
and those who have died are also present. And they're passing around the plate, the pattern that has the body of Christ on it. And as they pass that pattern around, those who have harmed or injured, either with negligence or intent, the other, look at them and say, the body of Christ broken for you. And they respond as we would, as I would, and also for you. You see, that's what I think this psalm is getting at. That injuries and wrongdoings and unkind words don't have to be permanent. Somehow, some mysterious way, in the love of God, they can be healed, move past, and enemies become friends. May it be so. The second thing that I pick up on as I read this is at the very end. It's that last verse. It's, I will live in the house of the Lord. If you learned it in King James or Revised Standard or New Revised Standard, that word is forever. Now, the Common English Bible, uh, which you read this morning, says, I will live in... The, I will live in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Okay? And quite frankly, I have to be t honest with you, I don't like it. I don't like that translation at all. I'm old enough to think that word is forever. Now, I will tell you that if you look in the Hebrew, if you can figure it out better than I, you, both translations are perfectly legitimate. I just like my translation better. You know, it's different, isn't it? When I think of my whole life long, yes, you can push the meaning out of life, uh, you know, to be extended, um, but um, that to me means from December 17th, 1963 until that day when God says, you're done. I don't like that. Nothing wrong with the CEB Bible. In fact, I covenanted with you to read the Common English Bible, the uh, regular readings throughout, and I have to tell you, I've put it aside just because I like the New Revised Standard better. That word forever means a lot. Think about it for just a moment. Forever means into the reality that John describes in his gospel at the sort of the end of his gospel when he says that we are heading for a place where there will be no more pain or suffering or heartache or sickness, that all things that are old are done away with and all that has become new. That in eternity there will be no pandemics, no COVID, no death that God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That's forever. I like that. I really, really like that. And when I think about forever, I'm reminded that God's provision and care for us begins from the very first thought that God, God ever had of any one of us. And it never ends. It continues on forever. Psalm 23 is a reminder that we live in the reality of God's presence. Many years ago, a few years ago, there was a horrible book. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Please don't take, waste your time reading it. But let me tell you what happened when I read it. Um, it was called the Bible Code. And it was this thought that if you count certain things this way and certain things that way and this way, that you're going to reach this secret message the Bible has for you. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Um, but there was one good thing that came out of it. I'm going to tell it to you 
because it works as a part of my sermon. If you take the 23rd Psalm, and you count the letters, and you reach the middle, and you count the words, and you reach the middle, it's this line. For thou art with me. Either way you go, it's the same place. God is with us. We are never alone. When the world is tough and hard and unkind and things don't go our way and we struggle and we wonder what in the world is going on, where is God? God is right there every time, every moment. When life is grand and we're laughing and fun is being had by all, God is right there. And every moment in between. So you've got the best thing from the book, so don't read the book. Just remember that. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There are times when God has to use his rod and staff on us. Have you ever, has anybody ever had sheep? Anybody ever owned a sheep? Smart people. Anybody ever owned a goat? Yeah, you know what I mean. They're not the easiest animals in the world to deal with. And sometimes what they do is they just eat themselves into trouble. They'll just start on the path and just wander off because the food is good. And then they look back and there's nothing behind them. And the shepherd has to go get them. And the rod and the staff are what coaxes them through sometimes a little unkindness to come back. Sheep are not the brightest. But the 23rd Psalm reminds us that God is with us and that God will use any means to bring us home. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God that we believe in. So today, as we prepare to leave, you've already completed your homework. Congratulations, you all get A's. Um, You've memorized the 23rd Psalm. And here's why it's important. I have been very honest with you in the past, and I've told you that I don't wait well. I mean, this is the guy, again, grocery store. If you have 13 items in the 12 or less lane, I'm watching. (laughs) And I just got my eye on you. It's something, there should be a law, Pat, you know, about that. And, And so what I really need to do is to pause and to think As I wait behind that person, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth through beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. That's probably more effective for me than tapping my foot or folding my arms. But just know that you can pray this psalm and any of these psalms like that. In just a moment, wherever you are, whatever that circumstance or your life might need in that moment. So now that you've got it memorized, please do it. Don't let it just be something that's, you have marked, I've memorized 23rd Psalm, I marked it off, and I'm done. Let it be something that informs and influences and directs your life. Amen. So we've got our closing hymn coming up, and Dick, that one is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. It's, a, it's, one of the, it's one of those hymns that doesn't get a lot of press, but it's just a really neat little hymn, and I hope you enjoy it.
us pray together. I'm excited to pray too. <laughs> Those guys are so cute. They just really are. Thank you. Let us pray. Give us, O Lord, steadfast hearts, which no unworthy thought can drag downward, unconquered hearts which no tribulation can wear out, upright hearts which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. Bestow upon us also, O Lord our God, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may finally embrace you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, go in peace.